dear students good morning to you all i welcome you all for the third semester in third semester in unit 3 we have the fiction the scarlet pimpernel the scarlet pimpernel is a nice interesting fiction based on a true historical incident but it is fiction and not true story the background and setting of the story is true but the entire incidents are fictional this beautiful thrilling romance suspense story is written by baroness emma rz a hungarian born british novelist now let us see some details about the author born on 23 september 1865 emma rz is herself an aristocrat by birth she is the only child of baron felix rz a noted composer and conductor her mother also named emma was a countess and daughter of a member of the hungarian parliament she was educated in brussels and paris then studied art in london It was at Heatherly School of Fine Art. She met an illustrator named Montagu Bastow. They were a blissfully happily married couple. They were happy, but however money was tight for them. It was at that period she uh, she started writing detective stories. Now let's move to next slide. So now let us look at her initial stage. So at the early period how she uh, how the scarlet pimpernel evolved so let us see that in 1894 at the age of 29 she married Henry George Montagu Bastow as i said earlier the son of an english clergyman. The couple had very little money and Emma's husband Montagu worked as a translator and illustrator to supplement his meager income. Then she began writing detective short stories uh, that were published in the Royal Magazine. Her first novel, The Emperor's Candlesticks, which was published in 1899, did not do well. But her second novel, Mary's Reign, was a bit successful and it was published in 1901. In 1903, she and her husband wrote a play based on one of her short stories about an English aristocrat, Sir Percy Blakeney. who rescued french aristocrats from the french revolution and that was the starting of the scarlet pimpernel series and eventually it became a huge success though she was born and brought up in a wealthy family after marriage she also struggled financially and uh, since she had the talent of writing detective short stories and when her life partner was also supportive she was able to uh, completely she was able to achieve complete success in her first uh, series of the scarlet pimpernel okay now let's move to next slide she submitted her novelization of the story the scarlet pimpernel under the same title to 12 publishers while waiting for the decisions of these publishers fred terry he is a renowned actor and theatrical manager and julia nelson she is also a famous actress during that particular period so they both accepted the play for the production in london's west end initially it drew small audiences but the play ran for 4 years in london broke many stage records eventually playing more than 2000 performances and becoming one of the most popular shows staged in britain it was translated into many languages and produced produced as play in many other countries and underwent many changes several revivals this theatrical success generated huge sales for the novel okay okay now let us look into the title the scarlet pimpernel pimpernel is actually the name of a small roadside flower 
There are many varieties like red pimpernel, blue pimpernel and so on. Scarlet means a bright red color. So the title means the bright red pimpernel flower. The protagonist in the play uses the name and the image of this particular flower to mask his real identity. So our author, she started writing Scarlet Pimpernel book series and it contained seven books. The Scarlet Pimpernel, so as I mentioned earlier, the same thing mentioned in the slide, it's an uh, English wayside flower. And it is symbol of Sir Percy Blackney's secret identity as the Scarlet Pimpernel. The Scarlet Pimpernel is set in the early days of the French Revolution. Each time Sir Percy saves an innocent aristocrat from the guillotine disguised as the Scarlet Pimpernel. So as I said earlier, the background and setting of the play is original. So now in the next slide, let us come to know what is this French Revolution all about, some important facts. So now let's move to the next slide. Okay, so now as mentioned earlier, this fiction is based on real historical setting and background. The story is set during the French Revolution. So we will move to the next slide. Okay, now let us see some important facts about French Revolution. The French Revolution was a period of major social upheaval that began in 1787 and ended in 1799. Historians widely regard the revolution as one of the most important events in European history. The upheaval was caused by widespread discontent with the French monarchy. And of course, the people hated the monarchy rule and the people hated the feudalism system and the poor economic policies of the King, uh, King Louis XVI. King Louis XVI, he was only 19 or 20 at the time of uh, uh, ruling the country, at the time of ruling the country during the French Revolution. He was immature and lacked self-confidence. He tried to be a good king, favoring public welfare, public interest, but however, his kingdom faced enormous debts. Maybe debts incurred uh, as his ancestors, uh, when they were ruling, um, might have might have waged costly wars. Uh, uh, so, so eventually, he faced many debts, and he was struggling to rule the country. And the people also hated his rule and the people also hated his wife Mary Antoinette. And Mary Antoinette, she was also accused and charged with having illegitimate child. And so eventually the French rebels, uh, they pushed this king and his wife Mary Antoinette into the gelatin. Now let us look into the next fact. It is said that at least 17,000 people were officially condemned to death during the reign of terror which lasted from September 1793 to July 1794 with the age victims ranging from 14 to 92. So this particular um, 10 months from starting from September to July. So September 1793 to July 1794. So this particular set of period is called as reign of terror in history. And the reason is because in that particular 10 months approximately 17,000 people were officially condemned to death. And if you look into the uh, range of age, age range of these people. So just you know even if they are rich the French rebels, they didn't bother if they are small children or if they are women or if they are old age people. So they don't consider these facts. If they are noble by blood, the people irrespective of their age, irrespective of their gender, irrespective of their uh, mental stability, these people are pushed into the guillotine. Now let's look into the next fact. The revolution led to the establishment of a democratic government for the first time in Europe. Feudalism as an institution was buried by the revolution. It led to the eventual rise of Napoleon Bonaparte as the Emperor of France. Now let's look into the next slide. Okay. 
now let us look into this first chapter so chapter 1 so for the chapter 1 the background is french revolution the background and setting french revolution paris september 1792 so i want every students to just to visualize a french revolution uh, so it is during that french revolution the incidents will be taking place so let us visualize okay so the background is french revolution so just imagine that a story is taking place an incident is going to take place in the french revolution okay during the french revolution time and the next background and setting is place the grave and a west gate so when we read the summary of chapter 1 we shall see what this what are those places so some of the important characters in chapter 1 are surgeon bybart surgeon grospier citoyen fakir tanville then french aristocrats and french republicans now let's move on to the next slide okay let's see the detailed chapter wise summary in bullet points for chapter 1 as the scarlet pimpernel opens the french revolution's reign of terror is imminent with dozens of aristocrats being guillotined daily so note the point dozens of aristocrats being guillotined daily so if you are noble by blood you will be guillotined and no more mercy at later part of the day the crowd rushed away from the place de grave to watch other interesting sites where aristos being escaped at various barricades and caught later by the french officials so daily the french rebels they used to crowd they used to crowd at the place called place de grave every time in order to see how the heads of a noble people is getting beheaded is getting chopped by the guillotine so once that is over by evening once that is over by evening all the crowd will move away from that particular place called place de grave and they all move to various uh, border gates to visualize or to witness certain other incidents so this particular place de grave so place de grave it is a place for public parades and the festivals so that means if anything public any public activity so there is one common place in which all the public activity can be conducted so this guillotine is conducted in this place called place de grave so after evening the crowd who had gathered to see who who had gathered in the place de grave they vacate that particular place and move on to border gates and move on to various barricades just to see how the aristocrats how the aristocrats trying to escape out of france foolishly and later being caught by the french soldiers okay now let's move on to the next point their ancestors had oppressed the people earlier and now the people had become the rulers of france so earlier the aristocrats their ancestors they were treating the working class people as slaves but now the time has changed and the working class people has started ruling the aristocrats every afternoon before the french gates were closed some foolish aristos dared to escape men and women's clothes women and male attire children disguised in beggars rag wanted to fly from france and reach england however they are caught by the committee of public safety so the french aristocrats they try to escape out of france but somehow their attempt to become unsuccessful when these french soldiers skillfully uh, spying them running behind them catching them and pushing into the guillotine now let's move to the next slide sergeant bybat's duty so there is one sergeant his name is bybat and he is very famous for his talent in capturing the aristocrats who try to escape out of the border gates now let us look 
um, let us look the character look at the character of this by bart and the, his beauty and uh, how he will be outsmarted by uh, aristocrat so let's see sergeant's by bart's duty was sta stationed at the west gate he is known for his ability to detect fugitives in disguise he would actually let his prey escape by the gates allowing them to feel relaxed and later sends french soldiers behind them to arrest them baibat was proud of the fact that he on his own initiative had sent at least 50 aristos to the gelatin however one day all the sergeants in command at the various barricades had had special orders it seems recently a very great number of rich people had been succeeded in escaping out of france and reaching england safely sergeant grasbier had been sent to the gelatin for allowing a whole family of uh, aristos to slip out of the north gate under his very nose by bot pompously says that citoyen grasbier was a fool by bot narrates how foolishly sergeant let the aristos escape he says grasbier was a bit drunk that day he had looked into the market cask and ensured that it was all empty and let the cart go through the gates later a captain arrives with a dozen soldiers behind him alerting grasbier that he had allowed aristos escape in the cart and they are on the mission to run behind the cart and bring them back to the country however it was not the people in the cart aristos but the captain and the dozen soldiers were the captain of the guard was the englishman in disguise and every one of his soldiers were aristos so now let's move on to the next slide no one had seen the mysterious englishman however citoyen fakir tinwell the public prosecutor to the committee of public safety during the french revolution would receive a scrap of paper handed to him by someone in the crowd in the course of the day the paper always contained a brief note that the band of englishmen were at work and it was always signed with a little star shaped red color flower which in england called as the scarlet pimpernel the guards at the gates had been doubled now the sergeants in command had had been had been threatened with death death penalty There was a sum of 5000 francs promised to the man who laid hands on the mysterious and elusive scarlet pimpernel. Everyone assumes that Baibat will be the one to catch the scarlet pimpernel. So one day, let's see what happens. So everybody has confidence, everybody trusts, everybody has faith on Baibat's talent. So now let's see how he will be outsmarted. An old hag whom Baibat remembers seeing earlier in the day approaches the barricade. She tells Baibat that she most likely will not be returning tomorrow as her grandson has smallpox or plague. Baibat immediately recoils and stands back and allows the cart move away quickly out of the gate. Minutes later, a guard anxiously approaches Baibat looking for the hag and her cart. He says, "Come to see Dutourne and her children were hiding in the cart." So, in those days during the French Revolution time, plague or smallpox is considered as a deadly disease because there was no vaccine or injection invented to cure the disease. Like how we treat corona in this present scenario, if somebody is having corona, we don't dare to stand near them. So, similarly, in that particular time, during that particular time. when a person is having smallpox or a plague nobody will dare to go near or examine them so that's what by but also has did this scarlet pimpernel also during that particular day in order to outsmart in order to deceive by but so what he had did is that he had um, disguised himself as an old hag and doing some work near the gelatin just to get attention of by but so just to get attention of baibat so baibat also remember seeing this particular old hag but he never realized that the old hag is in disguise so when the cart approaches in the evening time near the border gate baibat baibat since he had seen the lady in the morning uh, near the place called the place de grave uh, near the gelatin so he didn't dare to examine the cart he didn't dare to um he was having full confidence that it is an 
old lady and when old lady says about smallpox so when i said there was no um, a solution or a remedy or a medication being discovered to the deadly disease so when he understands that 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 when that particular lady says when that particular old hag says that the person is having smallpox the person who is inside the cart so he immediately moves back he immediately moves backwards and allows the cart to move away but it is in that cart scarlet pimpernel scarlet pimpernel is the old hag and in that cart three aristocrats were escaping out of france okay now let's move on to next chapter so before moving next chap so before moving next chapter so you have the image of french guillotine so you have the image of french guillotine so you can see how noble people how noble people if they are noble by blood how their heads are being chopped in the guillotine fine so this is the image now let's move on to next slide now we are in chapter 2 so in chapter 2 we have a different background and setting so chapter 2 3 4 5 will all have the same background and setting so the background is the coffee room of the fisherman's rest so the fisherman's rest is actually a small inn okay it's a small inn like for example uh, in india tea stall is famous right so similarly in european countries coffee house is quite famous so coffee house is a place why it is quite famous is because it is the place where people get to know the political activities or where people share certain information public informations uh, nowadays we have this electronic gadgets nowadays we have this uh, wifi internet but uh, during those days um, this coffee house is the common place to get the news so what is happening in the country what is happening in other country so when people of different parts of the country when people of different parts of the world when they meet in one particular place they get to know more information so that is how coffee house in olden days are quite famous so this particular coffee house it is called as the fisherman's rest so that's the background and setting the important characters in chapter 2 mr jellyband and his only daughter sally and uh, you have mr hempseed so he is a regular visitor of that particular coffee house and an educated person also and other regular visitors of fisherman's rest will also take part in chapter 2 now let's move on to the next slide yes in chapter 2 in chapter 2 we are introduced to mr jellyband the landlord of the fisherman's rest in dover Dover is a coastal town in England. It is a major port for ferries to France. The Fisherman's Rest is a special inn which is the frequent haunt of the League of the Scarlet Pimpernel. So, the Scarlet Pimpernel and his members they often visit this particular place. But nobody knows who is the real Scarlet Pimpernel. But he comes in with a secret identity. but anyhow that uh, we will when we discuss other chapters we can find out that now let us see let us read the next point the owner of the fisherman's rest and sally's father mr jellyband jellyband is described as a worthy and a honest host he refers to the french citizens as murdering devils and believes that england should interfere on behalf of the aristocrats jellyband discusses the affairs of nations with mr hempseed who was an authority and an important personage at the fisherman's rest his learning and notably his knowledge of the scriptures was held in the most profound awe and respect jellyband informs jemmy pitkin visitor of fisherman's rest that the young lord tony and his friend sir andrew fox and other young noblemen had saved the dukes and duchesses of france from the guillotine so we get one information and that information is shared by jimmy pitkin so jimmy pitkin he conveys to jellyband the owner of the fisherman's rest that 
few aristocrats few french royalists uh, they have been they have been escaped they have uh, they, they escaped out of france with the help of lord tony and his friends and lord tony and his friends they belong to england now let's move to next slide so you have the image of coffee house here so that's the image of coffee house here um, i was not able to get a clear picture in internet so this is this image is vague but uh, we will be able to find out or we will be able to exert how the coffee house looks in olden days right okay now let's move on to the next slide so chapter 3 so in chapter 3 we have mr jellyband lord antony dewhurst sir andrew fox comte c de tourney her son vicomte de tourney and her daughter susan so comte c is the french equivalent of a countess a mid ranking title of nobility and the same setting as we saw in chapter 2 now let's move on to the next slide so now let's see what happens in chapter 3 in most parts of england feelings ran very high against the french and their doings suddenly the door of the fisherman's rest opens and lord antony dewhurst the son of the duke of exeter and a very perfect type of young english gentleman enters the coffee room at the fisherman's rest everyone knew him for he was uh, fond of a trip across to france and always spent a night under worthy mr jellyband's roof on his way there or back lord antony informs mr jellyband that a few aristocrats have just arrived from france having evaded the clutches of the republic so in chapter 3 so what we get to know in chapter 3 is that lord antony is giving one information to jellyband and the information is that jellyband he is likely to receive few guests from france that particular evening and those few french royalists are actually fugitives escaping out of france so jellyband is likely to receive them now let's move on to the next slide mr jellyband he also gives one more information to lord antony so when lord antony is inquiring whether this jellyband whether he is uh, expecting any guest that particular day and for that jellyband says of course but not uh, but not any stranger the person whoever is going to come that particular day and you are well acquainted with those people so he also gives that information so let us see that mr jellyband tells lord antony that he is not expecting any other guest except for sir percy blackney and his wife lady blackney but they won't be staying long he also says that his lady's brother is crossing over to france today in the day dream which is sir percy's yacht fine so let us just see in detail the information shared by jellyband so jellyband says that they are likely to receive sir percy blackney and his wife lady blackney so lady blackney her actual name is margaret saint just so margaret saint just she is having one elder brother and that elder brother is likely to leave for france so he had stayed in england temporarily and now he is going to france he is actually a french rebel uh, he supports french working class people and uh, so um, so lady blackney's brother armand his name is armand he is going to france so in order to bid farewell to armand sir percy blackney and margaret i mean lady blackney so those people so they both will be coming to the fisherman's rest house that particular evening so jellyband gives this information sooner andrew fox 
friend of Lord Antony, brings three aristocratic refugees from France to the coffee house. They are Comtesse de Tournay, her son Vicomte de Tournay and her daughter Susan. Susan. Okay. So, uh, so as Lord Antony already informed, so Jellyband is likely to receive French guests. So along with the three French people, Andrew Fox is also coming. Andrew Fox, he is escorting these three fugitives. These Englishmen, Lord Anthony Dewhurst and Sir Andrew Fox, are close accomplices of the Scarlet Pimpernel. So these two people, these two gentlemen, belong to the group, belong to the League of the Scarlet Pimpernel. Now let's move on to the next slide. Chapter 4, so the same setting, coffee house. So the important characters, Mr. Jellyband, Lord Anthony Dewhurst, Sarah Andrew Fox, Comte C. de Tournay, her son Vicomte de Tournay and her daughter Susan. Now let's move on to the next slide to know the summary. Okay, as Lord Anthony and the Sir Andrew sit down at the dinner table with the Comte C. and her children, the two strangers sitting near the back of the coffee room slip out quietly. Fine. So now just imagine a conversation is taking place among five people in coffee house. So who are the five people? Andrew Fox is there. Lord Anthony is there. Then Comte C and her two children are there. So totally five people sitting across the round table having conversation. They also notice two strangers. Lord Antony, since he had been a regular visitor of that particular coffee house, he knew many of the people, but to him these strangers appear a bit different. So he was expecting the strangers to leave the place and when the strangers after playing dominoes, when they bid farewell and when they leave, uh, this particular Lord Antony and his group members, they feel uh, relaxed. Lord Tony reassures Comtesse de Tony that her husband will safely escape France just as she and her children have. So Comtesse de Tony she will be worried about her husband uh, because uh, during that particular reign of terror, so during that particular reign of terror, these Englishmen were able to save only Comtesse and her two kids. So she is still bothered about the fate of her husband. The Comtesse begins to cry, the Countess begins to cry and Lord Antony and Sir Andrew look on with compassion but say nothing. Susan gradually falls in love with Sir Andrew as well, as well and is certain that he will rescue her father from France rebels. Sir Andrew tells her that he is, about a, that, that he is but a humble tool to his great leader. He also reveals them that their leader works in the dark and his identity is only known under a solemn oath of secrecy to his immediate followers. So in chapter 4, the title itself the Scarlet Pimpernel League. So the title of uh, this particular chapter 4 is the Scarlet Pimpernel League. So the Scarlet Pimpernel League in sense in this chapter if you give a thorough reading you will get to know some information about uh, this uh, leader, the Scarlet Pimpernel. So Lord Antony and Andrew Fox, they will be proudly with a pride, they will be describing about their leader. These French fugitives, these French fugitives, they want to show their gratitude, they want to thank the leader. But when they ask whether they can meet the leader, Fra Lord Antony and uh, Andrew Fox, they deny saying that his leader remains uh, in secret identity and his identity is only known to his immediate followers. Now let's move on to the next slide. She asks Lord Antony how many men are in league with the Scarlet Pimpernel. So Susan, she asks Lord Antony. So she wants to know more about this particular league. So when she asks this question, how many people are there in the group in the league? Lord Tony, he replies, 20 all told, he answers, 
1 to command and 19 to obey. The Vicomte tells Lord Antony and Sir Andrew that the women in France have been more bitter against us aristocrats than the men and the Comtesse agrees. One woman, particularly named Margaret Saint Just, had denounced the Marcus de Saint Sir and all his family to the off awful tribunal of the terror, she tells them. So Vicomte, Vicomte is the son of Comtesse de Tournay. So Vicomte, he is telling that there is, not there is, he is telling in general so in general more than men it is women are the tra traitors it is the women the noble women are traitors in france and he gives one example and he gives one example so that example is that there is one particular lady her name is margaret saint just so margaret saint just had played an evil role in pushing another royal family into the gelatin but actually these people have misunderstood um, it have misunderstood Margaret but anyhow Margaret Saint just they hate Margaret Saint just and she is being charged uh, with uh, like she is being accused of a traitor accused as traitor Margaret is a famous French actress who has recently married an Englishman who is none other than Sir Percy Blackney the richest man in England Come to see wishes that she should not happen to see Margaret. However, suddenly a stable boy burst through the door of the coffee room, announcing that Sir Percy and Lady Blackney are arriving to the coffee house. So, here in this fourth chapter, the Countess, she hates Margaret Saint Just, and as long as she stays in England, she doesn't want to face Margaret. But they don't know Comtesse and her kids they don't know that Margaret is going to visit that particular inn that evening so now let's see what happens when these two people these ladies when they meet each other now let's go on to the next slide chapter 5 so important characters in chapter 5 the same set of people and the same background and now let's look into uh, the conversation between Suzanne and Margaret and Margaret and Comtesse de Tournay, their reaction towards Margaret, their aversion towards Margaret. So we can see all those things in chapter 5. So briefly summing up, let's look into the next slide, the brief summary of this uh, chapter 5. The Countess, Comtesse, stands immediately at the mention of Lady Blackney and denies paying any attention uh, to her. However, at 25 years old, Lady Blackney's beauty is at its most dazzling stage and she is impeccably dressed. Lady Blackney turns and faces Susan, who happens to be an old school friend. However, Susan's mother, Comtesse de Tournay, forbids her daughter from having any friendship or any talk with Margaret. Jellyband and others are stunned when the Comtesse insults Margaret. However, Margaret, she perceives all these things with a cool set of mind. So once these French fugitives, when they go to their room, when they go to their room in the coffee house, later Margaret will be imitating them. Funnily. So we can see that in the chapter in chapter 5. So we will move on to the next slide. A short analysis, a very short analysis. So let's look into the analysis of uh, Scarlet Pimpernel from chapter 1 to 5. The Scarlet Pimpernel is the first novel in a series of historical fiction by Baroness Aussie. It was written after her stage play of the same title enjoyed a long run in London, having opened in Nottingham in 1903. The novel is set during the reign of terror following the start of the French Revolution. Sir Percy Blackney leads a double life. So Sir Percy Blackney is the Scarlet Pimpernel, the husband of Margaret Saint Just, but Margaret Saint Just she herself doesn't know that. 
she herself doesn't know that and many people don't know that it is Sir Percy Blackney is the Scarlet Pimpernel. Okay, fine. Let's read further. Apparently nothing more than a wealthy fop. So this Scarlet Pimpernel who is in disguise of a, a fop, of a fool. So this Sir Percy Blackney leads a double life. Apparently nothing more than a wealthy fop. But in reality, a formidable swordsman and a quick thinking master of disguise and escape artist. In 1903, this novel was produced as a play and it became the favorite of British audiences. Now let's move to the next point. The popular success of the novel is considered to be based on the myth of the aristocratic hero with a double life along with the love story and the conflict of loyalties. Now let's move on to the next slide. Baroness R.Z.'s opinion of the French Revolution is clear from the start of her novel. The French citizens revolting against an oppressive aristocracy and feudal system are described as animals. So if you read the novel, the way Baroness Emma R.Z. described the French rebels is equal to describing the character of animal. Whereas, when she describes about a French royal, she describes them as blue blood. So, whereas the French royals are described in terms of superiority rooted in blue blood. R.Z. does not paint a flattering picture of the French Republic. She notes in a way that the aristocracy has treated the French people unfairly, but she implies that the punishment doesn't fit the crime and that innocents perish alongside these who might deserve punishment. Now let's move on to the next slide. Yes, now we see a uh, few important questions from chapter 1 to 5. So the question, first question is which period is called as reign of terror and why? Second question, write a detailed note on how Sergeant Grospierre missed the fugitive's right under his nose. Third question, write a detailed note on how Baibat was outwitted by the Englishman, the, scar, the great scarlet Pimpernel. Fourth question, write a short note on the coffee house and the fisherman's rest and its significance in the novel as given in the early chapters. And fifth question, write a short note on Lady Blackney's Margaret's character as given in the early chapters. Thank you for patiently listening. Thank you.